Security Data Analytics and Visualization, Session 8, Files, Images and Videos. Visualizing files. Often we may want to understand the data that resides on a computer, such as what files exist and their content. Furthermore, there exists a wide range of file formats that we may want to examine, ranging from binary data and executable files, through to text files and office documents, and even multimedia content such as image and video formats. In this session, we will begin to examine methods of analysis and visualization that can help to understand such content beyond typical manual investigations. Binary file visualization. All data files stored on a computer system, no matter what their content is, can be expressed as a byte stream. This is the raw data that is processed by the computer to convert this data into a meaningful representation for the end user, or to inform some other process or executable. As defined on Wikipedia, the byte is a unit of digital information that most commonly consists of 8 bits. Historically, the byte was the number of bits used to encode a single character of text in a computer and for this reason is the smallest addressable unit of memory in many computer architectures. An 8-bit representation can be used to express values in the range 0 to 255, i.e. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, through to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in binary notation. Working with a byte stream for a file, we can then visualize these numerical values. Given the scale of information represented within a single file, we need a compact visual representation as we may be attempting to plot many, many values. Pixel-based visualization is an effective technique where we can map numerical values to pixel color values to create an image based on the underlying numerical data. In this example, we simply map each byte of the file to a color value for running left to right, top to bottom, i.e. run length. This preserves order in the file content. The visualization size is determined by the size of a file, which may be useful, however can also make comparative analysis difficult. In the above, we show three files, a docx, a docx with password protection, and a docx with AES encryption. And we use a fixed width of 512 bytes. We can begin to examine similarities and differences between these files using the visualization scheme. Most notably is that the password example shows the additional password data and some commonalities with the original file, whereas in the AES example, the data is fully encrypted and not recoverable without the encryption key. Another approach is similar to that of n-grams that we discussed during text analytics, where we consider pairs of bytes to form a diagram visualization. In this setting, we take each pair of bytes and treat them as the x and y coordinates to plot a point on a scatter plot. Points can be scaled based on number of occurrences if necessary, or color coded based on byte position or sequence. Below we can see examples of JPEG files, a text file, and a docx file. In the examples, the scatter plot is bounded between the values of 0 to 255, and so helps maintain a consistent representation to help comparative analysis. For instance, frequency of byte pairs, density of byte pairs. A trigram could also be created using triplets of bytes and plotted using a 3D scatter plot. Image and video analysis. While binary file visualization can be utilized for all forms of digital data, images and videos are a unique data format that lend themselves to further analysis. As visual stimuli, they are inherently understood and interpreted by humans. 
Image and video files are particularly large compared to many other file formats that are commonly used on most computer systems. Furthermore, image and video data has inherent spatial information that is fundamental to, for understanding their content. We will explore this further in this section. Firstly, why may we be interested in image and video analysis for security? Closed circuit television, CCTV, has been used for many years to monitor physical environments from a security perspective so that instances can either be identified at the time of the event or at the very least be examined after the incident has occurred. This results in many hours of video footage that is likely difficult to search and retrieve specific content from. Beyond searching video based on a timeline, how may we be able to search video based on other characteristics, such as when a person is wearing a blue jacket, black such as when a person is wearing a blue jacket or identified by other characteristics. We may also want to identify more sophisticated concepts, such as when a particular action occurs, activity recognition, when particular persons are in the scene, facial recognition, or when a change in behaviour is observed, anomaly detection. In many ways, what we are interested in is a way of summarising video content where video is denoted as a series of sequential images of which we need to filter the volume of data being examined. To motivate this example further, let us first recap on video attributes. A video is essentially a stack of sequential images. A single colour image is expressed by a computer as a three-dimensional matrix, width times height times channels where channels is typically RGB, red, green and blue. A video can therefore be expressed as a four-dimensional matrix, width times height times channels times frames. For our example, we have a short video of 2 minutes and 32 seconds. At the standard 30 frames a second, we therefore have 4,574 frames that make up the video. Our video has a frame height of 480 pixels and a frame width of 600 and 360 pixels. In short, our video has over 2 billion data points. What may we want to achieve from our analysis? Firstly, we may want to identify changes in our video stream, for example, if we have a CCTV stream, can we identify keyframes where something may have changed? Secondly, can we group or cluster similar frames together? This may help us to group similar patterns of the activity and identify activities that stand out as different in some way. For our examples, we will work with the McGill Real World Based Video Dataset, which is available online and via Blackboard. This dataset consists of 20 unique users where each user is filmed for a short interview clip of a couple of seconds. We will aim to identify changes in the scene, i.e. where a new user appears in the video, and also cluster frames for each user together.
As our first stages of analysis, we will need to make the data more manageable to work with. We can begin by reading our data file and extracting a single frame per second rather than 30 frame frames per second. Since we are not trying to track motion between frames, this is fine for our application and more importantly makes the problem much more manageable at 153 frames rather than 4,574. Secondly, we can reduce each video frame to a grayscale image, meaning that we have only a single color channel rather than RGB. Again, color is not required for the purpose of our application, so we can afford to remove this. We now have a set of 153 grayscale images that represent our video, where each image is 480 pixels by 360 pixels in resolution. We're going to adopt a common technique that we've seen earlier in the course called principal component analysis. Recall that PCA will take high dimensional data and reduce this to a low dimensionality, for instance, two or three dimensions. Each point in our projection should represent a single image and so the high dimensional data is essentially the set of pixels that make up an image. While spatial information in images is important for us humans to understand image content, it matters little to a machine. Therefore, we could reshape our image matrix so that instead of being rectangular, it is a single row of data. Or to put it another way, it is a vector of size 1 by 172,000 800 elements. Providing we remap each frame in the same manner, then each column in our new matrix represents a unique pixel position that can be compared across all frames of our video. Having remapped each image frame to be a vector, we then stack these in sequence to form a new matrix of size 153 by 172,800. Having remapped our data, we can now simply perform PCA on our matrix. As discussed before, this will essentially identify the features, columns, of greatest variance across all instances, i.e. image frames, of our data. Luckily, we can use the scikit-learn library to perform this task quickly and easily. We can plot the resulting values as a scatter plot, where we can begin to identify points that have been clustered together. We now have a set of unlabeled points, and so, as we have seen earlier in the course, we can use k-means clustering to assign labels to each point. We know in advance the k should be 20. We have 20 unique users in the video data. So having performed k-means clustering, we could then colour code the scatter plot according to group assignment. That's it. We have now taken a video and identified the similarities between the extracted image frames to cluster similar frames together. We can see on our plot here we have 20 clusters identified as colour coded in the plot. To check this, we could display all images within a group, given group to see whether the frames do in fact appear similar. Here we can see that these 12 frames all show the same woman. It should be noted that this method may not always give perfect results. For example, removal of RGB may result in too much information loss, but hopefully it demonstrates the concept. As for recognising change between video frames, we can easily use the same matrix remapping to achieve this. For each row, we calculate the absolute difference in pixel values between this row and the next. We can then summarise the total pixel values using the mean to express this as a single 
difference value between two frames. Using a line plot, as shown here, we can observe peaks that are likely for scene changes in the video, and so we can identify an appropriate threshold for scene change detection either manually using the plot or automatically by separating the peaks from the smaller frame differences, which are a result of both, both motion and image noise video compression artifacts. Summary. We have discussed methods for visualizing file content, be it as raw binary data in the form of a byte stream, or in the case of richer multimedia such as image and video, how we can process raw image pixel data. One of the key points to raise is that we've been able to adopt many of the methods we've used previous in the course. This is important to recognize since file data is essentially just another form of data that we can work with. Image and video present some further interesting challenges, primarily due to the inherent understanding that humans have of images and videos. However, we can perform analysis on pixel data much as we can of any other data attribute. Multimedia content such as image and video is shared online in such volume nowadays that we do need better methods for analysis of such data. As discussed, videos are inherent to humans but mean little to a machine. So how would a machine work to prevent the sharing of indecent video content? Given the nature of reposting and sharing of videos, this becomes important to stop the spread of malicious or dangerous content online. Examples have ranged from videos of terrorist attacks, unwanted sharing of sexual videos, and intentionally graphic violence injected into vid children's video. Given how online video is now considered general behaviour for many households, ensuring video content is safe for users is a vital area of protecting cyberspace. Video analysis also naturally plays into inside threat detection, open source intelligence and forensic investigations. As technology continues to evolve with connected autonomous vehicles, health tech and industrial IoT, Video streaming and video analysis is a crucial aspect of such systems to analyse, detect and respond to real-time conditions, be it reacting to a moving vehicle to avoid a collision, or adjusting a medical dosage based on image analysis of a patient. Cyber criminals wanting to compromise such systems will inevitably exploit image analysis techniques, a prime example being the generation of deepfakes to falsify video content that is shared remotely. Therefore, as cybersecurity professionals, it is important to understand and acknowledge these attack vectors and begin to consider how best to defend against them. As adversarial learning proves, relying on artificial intelligence alone may not help to combat the situation, but understanding how to process image and video content and how to contextualise video content to understand the story being told will ensure that as defenders we are better prepared to protect our systems especially those that are becoming more and more embedded within our society.